<laughs> While we load up, I love to jam out to my mental flows. So, welcome, and here we are. It's Will Frazier here, broker, founder, and some other good and stupid stuff here at Craftsman Real Estate Services, where we... On Craftsman Real Estate Services side, help people buy and sell homes. And that does include a lot of investors and people looking to buy and sell their personal homes. And on the property management side, we help tenants and landlords alike solve life's problems. Most of the time, we take care of people. But sometimes expectations lead us down a path of destruction. But that's neither here nor there. We got plenty on that later. I wanted to recap the bigger conference that happened last weekend and early this week in New Orleans. And let me just start by saying I got to go. It was fun. Me and 1,500 of our closest friends. And last year, the year of the dog, 2020, uh, was uh, the, the first one I was supposed to get to go to. Then I got canceled. I missed the one in Nashville. And so I was pretty excited about the conference this year. And you know, when you're going into a conference in general, there's a lot of questions and a lot of variability that you can have around what's the purpose. So when you're getting any, anytime bigger pockets is involved with something, it's going to tend to be very heavy on um, rookies, on, on new investors, but not exclusively. And that's one of the unique things about bigger pockets as a community is that there are many people um you know, like me, who are not beginners, but are not like the pundits. There are many people who are decades more seasoned than you know my community or my my peers. And there are people who have never done a deal, who have never bought a rental property, never operated one, never done a flip, but I mean, they know that they want to, and so they want to get around people who have done that a little bit, and they can you know they can learn from them. And so it's interesting when, when anytime you get a group of people together. At an event, you've got to make decisions on who you're going to cater to and, and what the goals are as a conference. And then the attendees also have to make a decision on what do I want to get out of this conference? And some people make that decision on the front, and then they have a very good opportunity to tailor how they participate in the conference with their, their agenda, with what they want to take out of the conference. And then other people don't make those decisions ahead of time. And sometimes aren't even aware of what they want. And yet they go and they kind of bebop along and hopefully all is well. And they end up accomplishing some of what they wanted. But that is neither here nor there. What I wanted to do is walk you through the key takeaways according to this guy from BPCon 2021. The conference opened with a keynote from Hal Elrod, the author of The Miracle Morning and a lot of other derivatives of The Miracle Morning. And Hal did not disappoint. If you've read The Miracle Morning, then you would have been familiar with several of the, the stories and examples he used in his talk. But in his keynote, he really just kind of he connected with us as a person, which was awesome and very difficult to do in a, in a crowd of 1,500. And I think that everyone that was listening had the ability to walk away with a conviction that we can do more like not from a not from a materialistic um you know variation of the hustle culture that says go out and do more like you need to do more don't rest don't sleep go out and do it but from a, a stance of if you will learn to reapportion your time if you'll learn to order certain times then you will find yourself de developing more emotionally, spiritually, physically, and intellectually than you ever thought possible. And in fact, in pursuit of goals, which I would say everyone at, at BPCon 2021 has goals, many of them, most of them, are goals surrounding real estate investing. And, and it was a great and very, uh, possibly very scripted framework to start out the discussion of these goals with Hal and, and his content. Because what it does is it reminds us that if we will leverage the power of the mornings and if we will live with an intentional rhythm in those times, then we can often learn more and then later earn more as a result of it. That's amazing. And I think we all walked away pumped that we can do it. 
that our bodies will function better, that our minds will function better, that we as spiritual beings will function better as a result of this choice to leverage the mornings. And so that was awesome. And then we broke out into small groups and I, through the small sessions, 1500 chunked into 50 up to 500, you know, depending on the session, got to learn about note investing from Dave Van Horn. He literally wrote the book on investing in notes. And then uh, also storing up profits in self-storage by Paul Moore. I got to uh, sit under Jay and Wendy Papasan and learn about planning and vision setting as a family. Fantastic. Um, learned about, um, oh, from Dr. Joe Asamoa about Section 8 rentals and how, why, why they're powerful, how it can be a powerful tool in any investor's toolbox and how he uses Section 8 as a partnership uh, in his personal investing. And so, you know, all through these micro sessions, these breakout sessions, we got the opportunity to choose something that is interesting to you. And so that was a particularly cool part about um, about the real estate conference is we had the ability to say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a total newbie here. I want to invest in real estate, but I just don't know how to do that. Or I've done a deal, you know, I, I bought a rental property or maybe I bought two or three, but now I've, I've hit this wall and I don't know how to go further. And then you also could say, okay, and you know, that doesn't interest me. These entry level things don't interest me. I'm interested in this thing over here or hey, this moderate thing over here. And so you kind of get to pick and choose and scale. Um, I also got to go to uh, Matt and Liz Faircloth's content on how to raise money for investments. And what I find is that each of these, these people that was presenting, at least the ones of the, on the sessions that I went in, they were all masters of that, that craft. They were all speaking about something that they were particularly well-suited in. And if you've heard them on the Bigger Pockets podcast before, or if you've read their books, most of what they'll share may not be surprising, but often they're able to give depth and nuance to those things that you can't get from the book. Uh, also, I found like as a result of uh, Dave Van Horn's session on note investing, let me, let me pop up and, and get that book right quick. Oh my gosh, sorry, I, I'm forgetting about <laughs> I'm forgetting some of the <clears throat> awesomeness of what we did. So Dave Van Horn's book on real estate invest. I can't you see this? Like, there we go. Note investing in real estate. So real estate note inve investing. I went to this talk because I'm I'm interested. I'm keenly aware. And we're at a point in our business where diversification is is prudent, and um, and so that that's cool. So. I went to this uh, the seminar and in, in an hour, he, he shared some great, great things. And then I bought the book and I find that 90% of what's in the book is something that he shared in that hour. Makes sense. That's what authors do is they distill their lives into a book. And then when you ask an author to talk, they're going to talk about what they care about. So that's pretty cool. You know, or you can view that as a bummer. I, I think it's really cool. But I think one of the really, really cool things is that is that once you know the author, you know, like you've you've heard them speak, you maybe even have the option or the opportunity to ask questions that are specific points of interest. But for me, I went to this seminar or this this session on something I was interested in, and I became more interested and then more equipped and aware on how to utilize that as a tool. So I think that was a really cool benefit of going to BP con. It's also probably a benefit of going to any conference. And so I'm, I'm aware that I didn't just get to, um, uh, to, to learn depth of things I already understood, but I got to learn new things and seek to be understood. And then also side benefit, if you, uh, speed read the book while you're at the conference, then you can often pursue the author with specific follow-up questions and then have a one-on-one -on -one Q and A session with the author. That's pretty cool. Also went to the uh, to the Amanda Hahn and Matt McFarland session on tax optimization strategies for real estate investors, and then bought the book, The Advanced Strategies, The Advanced Tax Strategies, because and it was another example. Like a lot of what I've heard them share on the podcast is what they shared at the conference, but they were able, especially in their like 20, 25 minute long Q&A session, they were able to layer on some things that were like advanced tax strategies or 
hey, this is how this and this and this can all stack together. And you might find some good synergies with that. And I think one of the things that I personally took away from my time at, in, in the tax strategy session at BPCon is, uh, you know, they talked about the difference in a tax preparer and a CPA or a, or a tax consultant or you know, accountant. And tax preparation is often what we think of when we think of CPAs. And that's that's taking the data and distilling it onto those horrid IRS, overly complicated documents. Like that is tax preparation. And that is a relatively cheap and an expensive task. It's a relatively simple thing. But especially as you continue down the, the trail of real estate investing, you find that things don't get simpler from a tax standpoint they get more complicated and especially as you as you kind of dive into some nuances like in this note investing book let's see if we can find this this picture real quick uh, he talks about different streams of income and he, he quote he cites another author and he pulls man sorry let's see if i can <laughs> all right that's mountains those are mountains. I got to work on my lighting. See if I can do this. Yeah, you see it. That's mountains. And so the point of this illustration is that there are different mountaintops. And so, you know, rain comes down on the mountaintops or snow or, or whatever. And so, you know, those are really different. But where we typically think of wealth is downstream after the snow's melted and, you know, and the rains collect and then kind of go down all the faces of the mountain and they all come down and they come in these little snow melt and trickle off streams. And then those join up into, which joins up into, which joins up into. And then we see that and we say, oh, that's wealth. We see this downstream stuff and we go, oh, that's wealth. I want that. But what we don't see is that many like masterful people, and I'm not talking about like these get rich people or these like monolithic you know, like you know, second generation wealth recipients, like things like that. I'm talking about masters who are creating wealth. Often how they do that or how they pursue wisdom in that is to develop multiple income streams. And so a lot of what I, I think that um, the the non-beginners in real estate can take away from a conference like the Bigger Pockets Conference is intersecting with not just the content on people who are talking about different streams, but, but also people who are utilizing those streams, people who are seasoned in those ways. And so if you're, you know, if, if you're kind of at the, if you are growing your real estate single family portfolio, you might decide to diversify into multifamily. You might decide to go into big, large scale syndications, or you might decide to get into the note investing business. You might like, and not, and not in a vacillation way where you're jumping out of one and into the other, but you're doing this and then you're going to add to it this. And I think that the beauty of, of that um, is that you can create those multiple income streams and downstream that will produce, if done with excellence and prudence, it will produce wealth, like quite, quite an impressive amount of wealth over time, but it also it produces some complicated tax situations and some opportunities to optimize by stacking strategies and to really lay out things very well. So I love that about uh, getting to sit under Amanda Hahn and, and, and McFarland's content. And uh, yeah, so that was really cool. And then to round out the evening, the first evening, we got to sit under uh, Tom Billu. He's a economist that I got to hear on the Jason Hartman podcast a number of years ago. And he just, from an economist standpoint, and not necessarily a real estate investor at all, like just owns real estate and owns a few different properties, it seems. But from a pure economist standpoint, got to walk through lots of data from the last several years and forecasting the last or the next several years. And what was fascinating to hear from this guy who spends his days looking at economic models and to see both how have those models held up in past uh, ebbs and flows what has happened when this happens like when the national debt raises to this amount or when company stocks raise to this multiple of earnings that you know all these different things and, and and they find trends and then they use those trends and they compare them over what has happened under certain scenarios and if they find that they hold in a in a in a multiplicity of of those scenarios playing out then they can use that to forecast 
the future. Those are called economic models or modeling. And so through their world uh, of, of seeing these economic models and employing those to hear that they, that in his mind, he looks at it and says, you know, 2022, your gravy. Interest rates won't rise. Here's the reason why. And it's not like a feeling. It's not, hey, you know, Ben Bernanke said this. It's not Uncle Jerome said this. It's not, it's, it's just, here's the economic model. This is what this means. And this means that this will happen in 18 to 24 months. And this is 24 to 36. And so from a data perspective, not just what the Fed is saying or isn't saying, but from a data perspective, this economist believes that interest rates will be flat in 2022, will rise perhaps a quarter to a half a percent in 23, a half to 1.25 in 24. They'll go up from there. The you know, the market, the overall economy will continue to grow, though though perhaps not at such an aggressive rate like it has been in the last year and a half, but it'll continue to grow until at some point there's an inversion where those interest rates go up and some other factors will will happen. And so now it starts to slow down. And he's saying like that's like 2025 is when you start to see that softening. And then probably by 2026 or 27, we're entering a depression, like, you know, a series of of economic depression, and that will possibly let land, you know, lead. Uh, that will possibly last for quite a while. And so, to hear this guy, who's not, you know, he, he's not drinking the Kool Aid from us. He's, he's he's beyond and outside of us, and and he's not, you know, he's not talking about what the Fed said or does, doesn't say. He's looking at data, and he's he's saying based on the data that we have access to, with a high degree of certainty, we believe that the next year coming up. The one that we can all be looking forward to as this is the last, you know, we're entering into the fourth quarter. You're in the fourth quarter <laughs> sorry, of 2021. Now we're looking to 2022 and we're saying, oh man. So as homeowners are, you know, if you don't refinance this year, are you screwed? You know, because are we going to, you know, are rates going to go up drastically next year? Therefore, prices will go down or do we have some time? And, and what this economist is saying is, hey, we should have time. We should have a great buying season and then we should continue to go up into the right for a while. And so as real estate investors, as, as you know, more than just homeowners, as, as multiple homeowners or investors, that's great news. It means that we still have an advantageous season ahead of us to go out and to buy real assets and to securitize those with long-term fixed rate debt that over time, the rampant inflation that is caused by our government peeing in the pool and calling it water and not pee, it's going to eat our debt. As Jason Hartman says that he coined or, or, or trademarked debt induced inf inflation induced debt destruction. Like the cost of your loan stays the same for the entirety of the loan if it's a fixed rate loan, yet the value of the dollar becomes lower and lower. So if you owe, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a month on your your principal and interest, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a month in ten years is less valuable than fifteen hundred dollars in today's money. In twenty years, it's far less valuable. In thirty years, it's far less valuable. So the the inflation over time is destroying the power of your monthly payment. So if you see you buy real assets and you securitize those with long-term fixed rate debt and inflation happens, which it should, because that's what happens when you circulate more dollars in pursuit of the same number of assets, or you, in, you introduce more dollars in pursuit of a, you know, more assets, but hasn't grown at the same rate. It's going to lead to more dollars being needed to purchase the same asset, which is price inflation. So, so that's that's kind of one of my takeaways from the BBCon is man based on this economic model in addition to some other things that we we notice across the country and in lending trends and builder trends in uh, what the Fed says we probably may have some good year or years ahead of us for buying homes it's unlikely that we're going to see a massive inventory release or a relaxation of the tightness it will probably get better, but probably slowly. You know, it's going to take builders a while to spin up. Uh, we also have an encouraging amount of building, new building starts. So, man, that's a, that's a good number. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're just, we're going to see the market continue to go up, most likely. 
And uh, and so that brings us into the final day. And so we got to hear Brandon Turner talk about one of the most impactful things for me personally in the entire conference is basically how do we pursue alignment uh, with what level we are, you know, and not uh, not in a dismissive way, because what Brandon said over and over again is the levels aren't wrong. They're not right, but they each have their limitations. And so his pyramid that he built was, um, you know, it's the multi-level marketing company that BiggerPockets is starting. Just kidding. Just kidding. They're not EXP. So uh, DIY is at the bottom. It's, it's you know, you scrap, you do it, you know, you know, like you go out and get your hands dirty, you roll up your sleeves and you do it. And that's how you DIY. And you can use that for a massively, a massively good approach. You can DIY your way through life and you can't, and, and that's not wrong or right. It's just, it's, it's a phase, it's a stage or a level and it has its limits. So for example, like that, I've been walking the DIY, uh, you know, way for all my life <laughs> years. And, and part of it for me is, is that I enjoy doing things, you know, who doesn't enjoy doing things, but I enjoy doing um, craftsman stuff, tool stuff, love getting to know how to do all these things. But the shady side, the shade to that strength of, of high competence and liking to do all that is that I substitute competence for self-worth. And that's you know something that for me is there in the DI stage is, hey, I believe that if I can do this, then I'm valuable. I can do this, therefore I'm valuable. And, and so when I detach those and I say that knowing how to do this isn't my value, I have other value. And then for me, that value is bestowed on me by God who says I'm valuable. And, and if he says it, then he's right. Not from a prideful sense, but from a deference to him sense. So when I can detach what I can do from my, my worth, then I get to say, oh, well, then bookkeeping, for example. Is a $12 task that I can hire out. Or maybe it's a different price, but it's a task that somebody else can do in two hours instead of five hours. They can do it better. And maybe they like it, or maybe they just systematized it so that it's a profitable business for them. Either way, if I can deploy my time at $250 to $1,250 an hour in things that I love deeply, like producing content, coaching clients, helping investors go from zero net worth to a million dollars in net worth, teaching people how to farm money, not literally, figuratively. Those things are light. They're easy. They're not even, well, they're light. And though they are not easy, though they require effort and intentionality and diligence and work, it feeds me. I got to have a call with an investor yesterday. That we, we ended up talking for an hour, for maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And at the end of it, I couldn't believe how much time had gone by. So this or the thing that I do that I'm good at, that I also am fueled by. You should do that thing once you can. And so detaching my self-worth from what I can do was a key step of me saying, okay, well, I need some help. So I'm going to hire. Uh, so my first thing was I hired a, I hired someone to help me do some stuff and I became project managers. And so that's Brandon's second level is project manager. So you're still, you're still the DIYer with some stuff, but you've now brought on help and you, you, know, you spend some of your time telling them what to do and helping them do it. And you spend your other time doing it and you're, you know, but you, you're able to do more because you've got help. And so that's, that's a phase that will take you quite far. And some people will all, will stop there and that's, that's it. And that's totally fine. That's good. It's not bad, but to some, but every level has its limits. And so what Brandon was pointing out is, you know, the DIY phase has its limits because you can only do what you can do. And if you're the one doing it all the time, then that's your limit. But if you step into that project manager role, well, now you have help. So now you can do what you can do and they can do what they can do. And so to, so you together can do more than what you can do. And so that's cool, but it has its limits. And so 
you know, for me, that that's the, the phase I've been in for the last year and a half. So before that, all DIY. And in many things in my life, I still am DIY, like 100%. And so I felt a call from, you know, during that time to say, all right, how do you, how do you level up? Not for the sake of leveling up, but for the sake of stepping into a point where you and your time and your energies and your, your efforts are aligned with your value. They're aligned with these other things. And he gave in, got into some nitty gritty and I hope they do uh, either they release that like hour and a half session, or maybe he does that on the podcast sometime, but either way, if you get a chance to hear, um, hear Brandon explain this, this pyramid, and the stories uh, attached to it, it is fire. So second level is project manager. Third level is COO, chief operating officer. And the difference there being, uh, you know, the, the project manager is still going to get their hands dirty because basically they, they're the DIYer that hired help. The COO turns into a person who is now leading the people doing. So the COO doesn't, you know, do, but they train, they equip, they add value to the people doing. And so, and that's valuable. And, uh, you know, but you're still, you're going to be deeply enmeshed in these things. And so that is where I feel compelled to step is, man, I need to be firmly out of the project manager uh, role, not, not the title, you know, but that role in my different businesses. And I need to step into the phase of saying, okay, I need to make sure that I have the right people in the right place. Santiago was a huge step in that because Santiago is, I believe, the right person for craftsman property management and some of the uh, functions of craftsman real estate services. And so how do I find others like Santiago, like the bookkeeping company, like our accounting people who I can plug into these things that I am doing that they can do either better or more lightly that perhaps are in alignment with who they want to be, need to be in order to live their fullest truth. I'm just kidding. That's, that's a little new agey. But <clears throat> anyway, so finding that alignment for other people by giving them the roles that match them well. So that, that is a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's got its limits. And so the the, the fourth and final well, sliver of, of Brandon's angle is architects. And so that's where he finds himself is the architect is architecting the different pieces of the puzzle and they're, they spend their time investing in their leaders so that those leaders can go and multiply their efforts. And, uh, and that's really cool. And it, I think it's a powerful vision not to glorify these different roles, but to be very self-aware and self and honest with ourselves to say, how am I doing? What fills me and what drains me? And is do things that drain me drain me because work is hard? Because the goal is not to avoid difficulty, but do they drain me because work is hard and, and it's futile and the earth fights back? Or do they drain me because I'm doing something that is out of alignment with my, my vision, my values, my skills and abilities? Because if it's that, then you're going to be more useful when you have alignment with that. And so maybe that's by taking a step to the next level. Maybe you've taken a step to a level that doesn't mesh with your values or mesh with your, you know, what your vision, like what you want in life. And so maybe you need to step down, but, but being very self-aware and honest and saying, hey, how am I doing and why? And, and then saying, okay, what needs to be true in order for this vision to happen? And is that something I'm willing to walk in? And so I thought Brandon's time and his content there was beautiful and awesome. And then throughout the rest of the day, we got to do some breakout sessions and then they capped it off with the live episode. And uh, right after a really cool auction for heroes, homes for heroes, I think. So all in all, was it a good conference? Yes. There was some powerful networking. There was some great content and there was a community of people where you're probably not the boss. You're probably not the newest. You're probably surrounded by people who can sharpen you, who you can sharpen, and who are an encouragement to keep going. And that is a beautiful thing. So, Bigger Pockets people, if you're watching, thanks for putting it on. Bigger Pockets community, if you get a chance to go to next year, do it. And also, Bigger Pockets people, if you live streamed it, that would be dope.
Keep your prices what they were this year for the live stream. Double it for the in-person. That would be awesome. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you didn't get to go to the conference, the one thing that I would hope you take away is this. When we live a life of alignment, it makes everything else lighter, easier, and better. And by that, I mean, if you are walking in your path and you know it's yours, you know that this is good. And I'm preaching this to myself, like to the depths. But if you're walking in a role that is yours and it's it's where you're useful and it has a vision that's deep and personal and, and meaningful to you, then the times of suck that will be there because it's part of humanity will suck with purpose, with intentionality. And if we embrace the suck, if we lean into the difficulty, if we grind through the pain, our character is produced, it's grown, it prospers. And with character and endurance and vision, we will achieve and do amazing things that we never thought possible. And most importantly, the thing that undergirds it all is we will be the type of people who are successful. Success comes to those who are the right types of people. When success, whatever, however we define that, comes to people who aren't the right type of people, it crushes them, it breaks them. But when success comes to the people who have become ready for success, mature foundations that can support the success in whatever ways that we do, we're talking, then the success comes and it finds in it a foundation that can support it and it doesn't crush them. We want to be people who are not crushed. We want to be people who prosper and prosperity is not financially. In fact, some wise men that I love to follow over at the Abraham's Wallet podcast would say that prosperity in financial terms is perhaps the lowest form of prosperity. It is of the five capitals that Abraham's Wallet talks about. It's the fifth. It's the lowest. Right now in our inflationary environment where we're literally flush with all kinds of cash laying around and you got it tucked in your sock drawer and you got to stick it somewhere so that the inflation moths don't eat it. We need to realize capital money. It's there. Abraham Lincoln. Oh, dude, if you haven't read, if you haven't read this book, read it. Devour it. It's a fantastic. Marin Katusa, The Rise of America. I just put book teeth mark on my book. That's dumb. Dig into it. It's fantastic. It's also written from a perspective of America will prosper and the future is America's. And so in this day and age, that's pretty awesome. And, and, and to attack it and approach it from a, uh, a numbers and data and fact driven way is amazing. Not emotionalism. Not saying like do left or the right. It's like fact and economics and about 180 pages started it out uh, just to get into like the foundation of economics from a very like approachable way. And then he jumps into gold, uh, silver, uh, different minerals, stuff like that. Just fantastic. And then he finishes it up with a couple of appendices. And I just read the appendice, appendix, yeah, appendix on uh, – the monetary history of the U.S. and learned in the Civil War, Abe Lincoln is looking at the bank account and saying, shoot, I got to run payroll and we don't have the funds. My words. Yeah, cycling up this. And then a, a senator or you know someone high up in politics pointed out that it, it is his sovereign right to issue currency. And so if he just issued currency and sent it to the soldiers then the soldiers will go out and spend it and and everywhere that they take it is legal tender and so they'll be accepted and and then you go in and is the phrase that was really gripping for me is go and pay your soldiers and go and win the war and so there, this this problem that that lincoln had this fiduciary problem of but the account is low is what I and, and probably several of us business owners face often when it's payroll time is <gasps> how are we going to do this? And we're working on that. We are working on that. We will not be here forever. But Lincoln had that 
And he looked in the coffers and said, oh, there's, there's no money in the coffers. What do we do? And the solution was just print more. So if that's the situation, if that's where we are, that the solution is just print more, then we need to know that the easiest thing to come by is those little green printed IOUs. The promise to repay. This is worth about 10% less than it was at the end of 2020. That sucks. Don't live your life for dollars. Don't live your life in, the, in dollars. Live your life for something else, for a lot of other things. Develop the depth of integrity and character and vision that will not just die with you, but will impact your communities in these days, your kids perhaps, and their kids and their kids perhaps. But they will make the world a better place as a result or as, as compared to the political rhetoric that we have today, which is not rhetoric. It is monologues bathed in anger and bathed in divisiveness. These things won't last even 10 years. These things will simply shred generations, break relationships, and leave people filled with regret or feelings of other people being the problem. So let's focus on building values, building value in companies and employing people with excellence, giving people excellent housing and treating people with dignity and respect. And when we do that and we check ourselves to see that we're walking in total alignment, then we will have a deeper satisfaction in our day-to-day -day lives. That's awesome. And what a thing to take away from a conference on real estate investing. Y'all, thanks for tuning in. If you're still with me, that's an honor. That is something I don't take lightly. And over the next few months, we will be ramping up our production value so that we can continue to add educational, well-thought-out content that hopefully leads you to a better and higher form of investing and real estate ownership. But also... We'll try to be a little more entertaining. All right. Have a wonderful weekend ahead and Shabbat Shalom.